Several years ago, I was out at a camp on Catalina Island. Now, I don't spend much time in nature, so I have to be honest, I was scared out there. Uh, we lived, or we stayed in cabins that had no electricity. Uh, and so I remember my first terrified night. I walked with a flashlight trying to find my way to my cabin. And I began to notice just how dark the dark really was. Even with my flashlight on, I could only see a few steps in front of me. And when I turned it off, I couldn't even see my hands. I could hear the ocean waves, but I couldn't see it. And so in a moment of panic, I said aloud, God, this dark is really dark. But then a moment later, I felt something in my spirit, a nudge that said, look up. And when I looked up, I was amazed to see a blanket of stars because I had forgotten about the stars. I live in LA. And folks, there are stars up there, not just the two or three that we can kind of see, but there is actually a sky thick with stars all around us. Sometimes we need the reminder to go out where we're uncomfortable. Sometimes we need the reminder to look up. This is what Advent is for. Because we get so caught up trying to find our way in the dark, and Advent reminds us to look up. In the past two weeks, we've talked about Advent as a season of waiting. Sometimes the pain and lament of waiting, but still waiting with full expectation and full hope. Amen. Sometimes we are waiting our whole lives. So we live in this tension of fully expecting, fully hoping that all will be made right, even as we can't even fathom how. Today, I'd like us to take another step into the waiting, because we all need to learn how to see. Because our faith is based on stories that happened long ago, before our time, in another culture. So I can't go visit with Mary and Joseph and listen to their stories. I can't interview the disciples to figure out if their testimonies are true. So how are we supposed to live in this time, in this reality, with just these old stories? Or how are we supposed to find a supernatural God that I can't see? How are we supposed to find the holy even in the midst of all of our unholy. If we can't see or touch or hear God physically, then we need to train our hearts to see and to hear. This is what the Christmas stories teach us. Because the Jewish community in that time, they had felt that God had been silent that they hadn't heard from God in centuries. And so they waited, and they cried out, and they still waited. But in the Christmas narratives, the Holy Spirit begins to stir. God enters into the lives of ordinary, unsuspecting people, and he says, wake up. God is here, and you are to be witnesses of what God is about to do. So every year, we enter this space of Advent because we need the reminder that God awakens us to the holy. But we need hearts to see and to hear. Hearts that notice when the Spirit is stirring. When the Spirit says, awake. Awaken your soul, for God is here. Our guides for today are the wise men from the East, also called the Magi. They teach us how to see. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We'll be reading first from verses 1 through 9.
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Let's stop there for a moment. You know, we really don't know much about the wise men from the east. Some scholars say that they, are from, they were from Persia, where Iran is today. Some say they were from Mesopotamia, where Iraq is today. But we don't actually know. Some scholars say they were kings, and others say they were actually more like astrologers. We don't even know how many there were. In all the stories, in all the songs, there are always how many? Three, because there were three gifts. We don't actually know how many people brought those gifts. This story is filled with mystery, and I believe that's intentional. Because the story is meant to open up ourselves to the mysteries, to the mysteries of God. Because here's what I find so amazing about this story. That Herod and all of his leaders, they didn't see the star. They didn't know which star to follow because they had stopped looking. They knew all the texts. They studied it. But we know that their hearts did not believe because we didn't see them running to Bethlehem. The Magi, on the other hand, they've been studying the stars for decades. They've likely seen spectacular events in the sky. But somehow, somehow they knew when a star appeared that was different than any other star they've seen before. Somehow their hearts knew that this star was worth following, to go on a journey that would last months, not knowing why or exactly where it would take them. I would like that kind of discerning spirit. I would like that kind of faith. How did they know? They knew because they've been waiting and watching for so long. It is the waiting and the watching that trains our hearts to see and to listen. To know when there's a moment that is different than any other moment. To know when that something is significant enough that it means that God is moving. They knew because they didn't just see with their eyes. They had to learn how to see with their heart. It wasn't enough just to follow the star. It is the heart, the spirit that convicts us to follow, not knowing exactly where it would go to. It is the heart that gives us that courage. So we need to learn from the Magi. And as I read this story, there are a few practices that I learned from them, practices that teach us how to see. The first practice is to open your heart to the mysteries of God. We often think that religion is about figuring out all the answers. Religion is not about finding all the answers. Religion is opening up your heart to the mysteries. Because if we think that religion is figuring out the answer, then we're in trouble. 
because we limit God to what our brains can come up with and understand. But if religion is opening up ourselves to the mysteries, then it is God who reveals who God is to us. If religion is the answer, then we define who God is. But if religion is mystery, if we open up our heart and our mind, then God will show you who God is. This is what the Magi remind us. That these wise men we know nothing about, they come from beyond the setting of the story, beyond the inner circle. Their presence in the story increases the mystery and our imagination of just how far the reach and expanse of God. This story opens up the possibilities of just how big God can be. Then God, that God can speak to nations unknown to us, even through the stars. You see, in, in most cases, people don't come to know God because someone else successfully argued and convinced them. And all of a sudden they say, oh, that makes sense now. Because if we're honest, it still doesn't all make sense to us. But more likely, you came to know God because you experienced something of God. An intimate moment, a miraculous sign, or something that happened just slightly out of the ordinary that touched you. It is the mysteries of God that draw us to God, not just the answers. And our hearts are wired to constantly search but I think our searching is not for the answers. We are searching for signs. Signs that God is there. Signs that God hears us. Signs that God will respond. And so today we can continue to look at the night sky to remind us of how big God really is. The stars, they show us how much we don't know, how much we don't understand. The stars, they open us to the mystery, the same mystery that all people on earth can see. The stars remind us to keep asking questions. It is human beings that have created our own lights, so bright that we can no longer see the stars. We can only look at ourselves better. We don't like mystery because it reminds us of our fragility we prefer certainty and answer and control. But if we focus only on creating certainty and answers in our lives, we will put God in a box. We will limit what God can do. We will easily miss God. And so the Magi remind us, as they looked to the complexities of the skies, they opened up their lives to the grand mysteries of God. And that is where God met them. And so the first step is simply open up yourself to the possibility of mystery. The second step that the Magi teach us in learning how to see is to look for divine inspiration. If we're open to the mystery, then God has space to speak in a variety of ways. In this story, God spoke through the stars, and later on, we'll see that God spoke through dreams. This is divine inspiration, how God speaks, how God communicates God to us. The Bible is divine inspiration. But if we're open to the mystery, there's so much more. In the time of Christ's birth, the people fully believe that what happened in the sky is not separated from what happens with us here on earth. The Magi believe that the stars and the earth and human life, they're all connected in meaning and that the spirit of God can be present in all of it. The Celtic Christians of the 5th and 6th centuries, they believed the same thing, that you can learn just as much about God from creation as you can from scripture. That creation, of course, is God-breathed, God-spoken, God's creativity, God's majesty, so we can read God in creation. It is our own scientific study that has separated us from the depth of meaning in creation. 
because we have tried to study it and conquer it and use it. We've forgotten to listen and to find God there. It is our own science that draws us away from the supernatural, from the possibility that God can work through miracles and the impossible and the unexplainable. But if we're looking, you will find divine inspiration. If we're looking, you will find the holy all around us. And this story gives us this clear contrast between the magi who were looking and all the religious leaders who stopped looking. The third practice is that we need to find God in the transcendent and the imminent. Those are big words. But transcendent means how big God is. That God is so big outside of our reality and our time and our space. Imminence is how near God is. That God is dwelling and moving in and around us. And in this story, God is both very transcendent and very imminent. To understand this more, let's finish the story. We'll go back to Matthew chapter 2. We left off at verse 10. Matthew chapter 2, verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. We will skip to verse 16, where the story continues. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. The ending of this story disrupts our image of Christmas. Because we find in this story the very typical image that we think of for Christmas, the wise men worshiping the baby and bringing the gifts, that is a, the wonderful and merry Christmas. But the end of the story takes a turn, a turn that makes us feel powerless. Jesus is born, and that is followed by a massacre. And Matthew, the author, he doesn't try to explain it or justify it. He doesn't end with, and then everything was all better. Instead, he recognizes the horror, and he describes the grief that can't be comforted. And then he ends the story of the Magi there. Matthew acknowledges the reality that this was and still is the world that we live in. That those with power make decisions out of fear, and injustice continues because of it. The Christmas story is not naive. The Christmas story doesn't ignore that Christ was born in the midst of great pain and great evil, because that is the imminence of God. The story of the Magi is weaved with the story of Herod. The story is in a political context, in a real time and place. That the birth of Jesus had political consequences, not just religious and moral. And we see in the story how having power distorted Herod's soul. He had power, but he also didn't. Because Rome gave him that power, and Rome could take it away at any time. And so he operated out of fear and insecurity. And he drew his power from destroying others. The prophecy of the Messiah was supposed to give him hope as much as anyone else. Instead, he was so threatened by a baby, it 
led to horrendous actions. It is disturbing, but it's not much different from our own time. You see, it's, sometimes it's much easier for us to believe in the transcendent God, the big and powerful God who created the stars and all will be made right. Sometimes it's much harder for us to believe in the imminent God, that God can enter into all of our mess and all of my mess, the trust that God can be present even in the very dark. The Magi, they saw God in the stars, the transcendent. But they also saw God in the imminent, even in a baby. The Magi, they came looking for a king. They met two kings, but they only worshipped one. And if you think about it, there wasn't that much for them to see. What did they see? They saw a, a poor couple with a baby. But... Somehow they knew, somehow they knew to respond in worship. Somehow they knew to give these gifts that you would usually give a king or the gods. And by choosing this baby as king over Herod, they were resisting the way that the world defined power. They were resisting what the world told them to worship. How did they know? How did they go there and see God there? It wasn't with their eyes. Their hearts had to know. It is a different way of seeing, and we need to learn that too. To see God in the imminent. To see God here and now. In this world, Good and evil is all intertwined. And we need to learn how to see the good, how to choose the good, how to see God here. It is our act of resistance against the ways that the, the world pulls us. At the end of this story, the Magi, they still had a very long way to go home. They had an extraordinary encounter, but they still need to return to their ordinary and their everyday. And Herod actually died soon after Jesus' birth, but other Herods followed his sons. And so the end of the story is an invitation to us that as we journey, this, as we continue the journey into the ordinary, into our everyday, Will you open yourself to the mystery? Will you look for divine inspiration? Will you find God in the transcendent and the imminent? This invitation is open to you today. Let's pray. Father, we come here as people that yearn and desire for more of you. Lord, we ask that your spirit would do the work of opening up our hearts and our minds and our bodies so that we can learn to see you and to touch you and to hear you. Train us, God. Teach us, God, how to see you every day. In your name I pray, amen.